So I, I get to introduce David tonight. So, so I first met David Pierce Snyder in, I, I don't even remember what year it was, but whatever Kitzhaber's first run as governor was. And when Kitzhaber got in, he goes like, okay, we need to be thinking about where we're going in this state and what's going on. So he had a big conference on Oregon futures and so forth. And, and uh, David was one of the uh, main presenters. And, and I listened to him and I go like, this guy actually is uh, credible as a futurist and yeah, very good. So, and that's why I met him in, and uh, to, to be uh, uh, full disclosure, he's on the board of the Institute and has been uh, for many years. So I have uh, greatly benefited from his advice and, uh, and counsel on, uh, on, on making sure that I didn't get in any trouble with IRS and stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, so David Pierce-Snyder is a, uh, what do you say, he's a data-based forecaster and has been for thousands of seminars and workshops on strategic thinking, uh, attended by representatives from most of the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, as well as hundreds of agencies and levels of government and uh, educational institutions, professional societies, trade associations. Uh, before entering private practice as a consulting futurist in 1981, um, David was the strategic planning officer for the Internal Revenue Service. So I say it gave me good advice. Uh, where he designed and managed the IRS strategic planning system. Uh, he was also a consultant to Rand Corporation and has served as instructor to the federal Executive Institute, that's all the upper level bureaucrats of the federal government, and the congressional and White House staff uh, development programs. He's authored uh, hundreds of articles and studies and reports on the specific future of a wide range of US institutions, industries, and professions, and on the socioeconomic impact of new technologies. He's the editor, co-author of five books, including Future Forces and a sequel, America in the 1990s, both published by American Society for Association of Executives. He also serves on the editorial boards of a journal which he helped found called On the Horizon and the World Futures Review and has appeared on Nightline, The Today Show, CNN, MSNBC, and BBC World Service. So with that, help me welcome David Pierce Snyder. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to share with you some of what I know about the future of higher education. I say some of what I know because I've been forecasting since I started with the Census Bureau back in 1959. So I know a lot about the future and some of it is directly related to uh, the uh, higher education enterprise. Now, um, in 1966, those of us who were early adopters of the futurist uh, work habits formed uh, an association, the first professional society of futurists, uh, the World Future Society. And uh, this was back before the internet, of course, so uh, it was a chore to send out mailing lists uh, uh, to canvas all kinds of people to join this new society, the World Future Society. And we were very pleased that in the course of the next 12 months, uh, about 11,000 people joined us. Um, and that excited us, that there were that many people interested in the future. What stunned us was that of those 11,000 people, over three quarters were educators. And um, we just didn't expect that. I mean. Don't get me wrong, great bunch of people, but we kind of thought it would be a broader cross-section of the society than that many educators. So when we had our first meeting and the membership all gathered, uh, there was a great deal of interest in talking to these folks and finding out why, why I mean, elementary school teachers, school administrators, um, um, uh, college professors, and uh, they explained to us why it was. They said to us, look, <laughs> they said to us, look, eh. now I'm, I'm old enough that I don't trust technology and not without reason. <laughs> what, what they told us was that education was about the future. They said, what's the purpose of education? It's to prepare students for their future. And as teachers, we need to know what the future is going to be like 
in order to teach them the right things. Well, okay, that made a good deal of sense. Since that time, the World Future Society has grown, but even today, a third of all the members of the World Future Society are, in fact, educators of various types. So, they are the working futurists. Oh, by the way, how many of you, when you hear the term futurist, are inclined to think of a rigorous professional discipline? Let me see your hands. Okay, all right, all right. I'm going to have to work at this. Um, well, all right. Being an old futurist, uh, and that's an important thing. If you're going to listen to a futurist, you want to listen to an old futurist, right? <laughs> we are humble. We have made dozens of 20-year forecasts, and then we've lived out to the end of the forecast, and... Whoa, that wasn't what we thought was going to happen. Let me go back and do this again, all right? So you learn some things over experience, and among the things that I've learned is a great deal of what people want to know about the future is simply not forecastable, right? Politics, political forecasts, weather forecasts, about equally valid, 72 hours out, max. Um, <laughs> You can't forecast the stock market uh, from one minute to the next. Um, economic forecast, we won't know how well this economy in the United States is performing right at this moment for another seven months. It'll take them that long to gather all the data and assemble it and be sure it's up to date and then conclude what the actual unemployment rate is right now and the actual uh, GDP growth rate. So you can't forecast that either. And a lot of people say, well, if you can't forecast politics or the stock market, what the hell good are you? Well, let's uh, talk about what we can forecast with some consistent reliability. And these are the three great classes of reliably forecastable realities. And you put these three sets of forecasts, demographics, especially the forecasts of the adult population. We can forecast the size and makeup of the adult population 15 years into the future with perfection. I mean, everybody who's going to be an adult for the next 15 years has already been born, right? There's no guesswork here. So we can tell you that. Uh, the structure of the economy. We can't tell you how well the economy will perform, but we can tell which sectors of the economy will grow, which will decline, what kinds of occupations will be in greater demand versus lesser demand. That we can forecast out 10 years because large systems and the U.S. economy is putatively the largest single system on the face of the earth, large systems are inherently stable. They change in an incremental manner. And finally, technology. We can't forecast technological breakthroughs. How soon will we have a cure for cancer? Uh, or even better, how soon will we have a cure for Alzheimer's? On the other hand, if we're talking mass use technology, those things have precursors built into the technological literature. And if you track that, you can tell with some considerable certainty what kind of technology will be in mass use seven to eight years out. And you put together these three classes of forecasts, and you have what we call in the futures business the knowable future. This is what we can be certain about in the future. So my talk tonight basically is to whisk you down the tunnel of data and tell you what the knowable future is of higher education in America. So here we go. <laughs> Into the dark. Oh, by the way, how many of you, I got to see, okay, I can see this now. How many of you are graduates of a campus-based post-secondary program? Let me see hands. Yeah, okay. Hey, certainly the bulk of the audience. And how many of you who did that regard that experience as having been instrumental and important in the trajectory of your life so far? Let me see hands. Okay, not as many. That's interesting. Not as many. But nevertheless, it looked like a majority of the house. So we're talking about something that has a personal relevance for you, an institution that has been important in your life. And I take that as an important aspect of my responsibility tonight to tell you what's going to happen to that important institution. So the first thing we come up on is the wonderful projections of the adult population. This graph 
shows the makeup of the U.S. adult population from 1960 through 2020, uh, broken down by six age groups. And all that roller coaster of change, of course, is the baby boom. Here's the boomers when they entered the labor pool and they became the largest group in our society when they were 16 to 24 year olds. And then time moved on and they matured, at least chronologically, and they became 25 to 34 year olds, 35 to 44 year olds, 45 to 55 year olds. And, oh, where it happened then? Well, they began to add to the 55 to 64 year age group, but it was very small. Why were there so few people in the 90s, age 55 to 64? Well, if you were that old in the 90s, you were born in the Great Depression. And during the Depression, the economic outlook was so terrible that birth rates and marriage rates plunged by more than a third. So there weren't very many of us turned out in the 1930s. Fortunately for the nation, the quality was unusually high, and so the nation, <laughs> the nation survived and prospered in spite of that fact. But now, the boomers began to add to that, and then in uh, 2010, as we famously know, the first boomers began to turn 65. So the over 65 population was, was more or less steady for 50 years. This little bump here, that's the post-World War I baby boom. We don't talk about them very much, but there was one. Anyway, here comes the boomers, and they begin to pour into the over 65 group. They rise sharply, and by next year, for the first time in the history of any civilization, there will be more adults over the age of 65 than any other age group in the society. Now think about that a minute. By 2020, it'll be over 20%, one out of five. By 2025, one out of four adults will be over 65. I said, one out of four people you bump into on the street will be geezers. Whoa! <laughs> Is this going to change our society or what? But what's more important from the standpoint of the future of higher education is the fact that the entry-level labor pool, the 16 to 24-year-olds, there they were when they were boomers. Here's the baby boom echo. And now it's headed down. And for the foreseeable future, the number of 16 to 24-year-olds in America will decline by about 2% a year. And indeed, college enrollment in America has been falling about 2% a year for the last 36 months. Exactly in, I mean, there are a lot of other people that will explain to you it's because of the high tuition costs, and that's probably got part of to do it, but mostly it is the population being served by higher education is actually shrinking. Um, so what does that say to us from a general standpoint? Well, what the Bureau of Labor Statistics says Hey, the entry-level labor pool, uh, 16 to 24-year-olds, is going to shrink uh, during the current decade by about 2.5 million people, a 12% decline in the number of entry-level workers. At the same time, here we have the retirement-prone 55 and over group, which will grow by almost 12 million, 38%. They'll make up a quarter of the workforce by 2020, and a great number of them are going to retire. So that's the challenge. First of all, we're going to have a shortage of incoming workers. And in particular, the young people are the ones who are adept at the new technology, right? And that's why you know, a lot of people refer to them as the digital natives. Uh, they grew up with this stuff. A lot of the people in the audience are actually digital immigrants, right? <laughs> you, you got uh, knowledgeable about technology as an adult. And then there are some of us who are digital aliens, right? We haven't made the jump yet, okay? But the important thing is that, hey, we're going to be short of the digital natives who really know how to use this technology, and when they come in to be employed by our company, they're going to be really helpful telling us, oh, don't you guys realize what you can do with this? Because a lot of digital immigrants don't know what they can do with it. So important. Um, now, meanwhile, the boomers continue to be our largest generation. Um, and remember now what they've done to us over the history of the boomers. At every stage of their life, they have jerked the economy around and caused big, important impacts. When they were born, right, most of the hospitals serving America today were built for the specific purpose of giving birth to 78 million baby boomers. 
right? And they're still out there, those hospitals. And then we had to build all the schools in order to school them, first the K-12, and then the colleges and universities, all built for the boomers. And then the suburban sprawl, we wouldn't have a suburban sprawl if it wasn't that we had to house 78 million people, 100 million households. Um, so at every stage of our life, they've jerked the economy around, and you can bet they haven't left the stage yet. They're going to do it to us again. What are the boomers going to do to us in the coming decade? Well, let's see. First of all, they're not retiring as fast as we expected. That's good because the entry-level labor pool is shrinking. So they're staying on, on the average, about five years longer than they plan. Those who plan to retire at 60 are retiring at 65. Those that plan to retire at 65, they're waiting till their 70s. So that's, that's one of the things. And then when they do retire, a third of the boomers go back to work after they've retired. About 20% of them go to college. I remember. Ah. Ah, thank you. Um, um, so we suddenly have, oh, this is going to make up for some of the young people who normally go to college. Now we've got old folks going back to college. Uh, my sister is here tonight, 70 years old, just went back to Lane Community College to take computer graphics. Wow, computer graphics at age 70. Why is that? Well, she's a fine artist. She's a sculptor. And at, at 70, her hands are not strong enough to hold that big mallet and that big chisel to carve out stone sculptures. So it's much easier, however, to do it virtually, electronic visual. So fine. Stays an artist, learns a new skill, keeps on chugging away. Uh, all right. So, oh, yes. And the other thing about the boomers, the warranty has started to expire on their parts. Uh, and uh, knee replacements, hip replacements, uh, they're all up for it. Even worse, now we have research that says the boomers are not as healthy as their parents were at the same age. And we say, well, how can that be? The, the boomers were so healthy. They uh, took up running and bicycling and, and they quit smoking. Oh, indeed, they did that. They quit smoking. That was very laudable. The number of smokers in America fell from about 40% to 19% now. There's a problem with that, however. What happens when you quit smoking? You get the munchies. The boomers all became addicted to double latte coffees and Krispy Kreme donuts. And now, uh, two-thirds of them are overweight and half of them are obese. Um, and so, as a consequence, they're going to reshape the economy one more time. Two-thirds of all medical services in America are consumed by over 65-year-olds, and the over 65 population will almost double in the next 15 years, which means that that's going to drive up the number of jobs and the size of the healthcare industry. Absolutely. In fact, healthcare is already 17% of the gross domestic product. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office says by 2020, it'll be 20%, and by 2025, a quarter of the gross domestic product of this country will be generated by health care taking care of the baby boomers. Um, and uh, the last time a single piece of the economy drove 25% of the gross domestic product was during the Second World War when we mobilized the defense industries to save democracy. So this is a big switch all by itself. Um, right now, one out of four of all new jobs created are in healthcare. And by the time we get to 2020, 2025, about one fifth of all the jobs in America will be in healthcare. As healthcare gets bigger and bigger, it is also consolidating. Really, until 2000, healthcare was a small business sector of the economy. It was mostly dominated by single practitioners running their own practices. And now, Fewer than half of all the doctors in America are self-employed as sole practitioners. Uh, and by the time we get out to 2020, uh, we will see that the entire of the healthcare industry, our largest industry, will be dominated by national and regional chains of hospitals, insurance companies, and medical malls. More and more shopping malls will be built or converted to entire medical services. So it's a one-stop shop. I can go in there and get my dentures fixed, 
get my eyeglasses ground, uh, go and get some physical therapy, all of it in a single convenient place. So that's what's going to happen. The largest industry in America will be driven even larger and forced to modernize as a result of this effect. Uh, now, what are the other important segments of the economy? Once again, as I mentioned, the econometrics. Bureau of Labor Statistics can tell us which industries are going to grow and which will decline. And right away we say, okay, here's health care, 34% increase, 5.5 million new jobs during the current decade. What are the other big growth areas? Construction. Wow, a third increase in construction employment. What are we going to be building? Oh, it's not what we're going to be building. It's what we're going to be rebuilding. Remember, most of the infrastructure in America today was built in response to the baby boom in the first place, which means all those sewage systems, all those fresh water systems, all the electrical power delivery systems, the housing stock is all reaching the end of its service life. And so a growing amount of our budget nationally as an economy will have to be spent on the maintenance and upkeep of our infrastructure. What else is going to be a big grower? Education, 15% growth, about a million and a half new jobs, all of them in post-secondary or adult education. The K-12 is pretty well set. The birth rates being what they are, it's pretty stable. We don't really need much more uh, investment in K-12. But what we really is go are going to need is the retooling of adults to deal with a marketplace that is changing rapidly. Then there's one other group that's growing, and this is the one that gives everybody hope. This is our high-tech future. Professional, scientific, technical, and business services uh, not related to education or medicine. So these are the lawyers, um, accountants, uh, architects, engineers, and engineers in particular. Uh, that's where the growth is going to be, and that's where uh, the colleges and universities think uh, is going to be their most important uh, situation. Now there's one problem with all that growth. Other than those rapid growth areas, all the other growth in retail sales, uh, financial retail services, leisure and hospitality, they're all in personal or consumer services. And the problem with consumer services is that their productivity, individual worker productivity, cannot be increased with technology because it's usually involving a one-to-one -one relationship with the customer. And as a consequence of that, the fastest growing jobs in America do not pay very well because compared to mass production jobs in manufacturing, et cetera, uh, you can't automate them. You can't infomate them. The net result is that median U.S. income is falling. It has been falling really for about 25 years, and it's accelerated in the last five, six, seven years. So everybody says, well, what happened to the high-tech boom that everybody is talking about? And the economic historians tell us, oh, not to worry, it's on the way. Uh, however, if you read the fine print of the economic history of the world, that those moments when a wave of mature new technology uh, causes a rising economic tide that lifts all the boats is always preceded first by a long, substantial downturn. This pattern was originally called by Joseph Schumpeter in 1911 uh, as a wave of creative destruction. It's perfectly straightforward. Uh, it wasn't until many years later that uh, economists at London School of Economics went back and actually put data on Schumpeter's model of the wave of creative destruction. And when they did that, we got a map of what it ought to look like for our current wave of creative destruction driven by computers. And what it tells us is uh, that, well, first of all, in the first 25 years of a new technology, they are so clunky, so expensive, so unreliable that they have no measurable impact on a technology. So the age of the mainframe, yeah, it had some useful applications, but other than that, it didn't change the economy very much. The second 25 years of a new technology uh, we begin to buy the technology and install it, but it's still clunky and not very reliable, and it doesn't fit well into our old system. And so, in fact, uh, productivity actually goes down 
during the second 25 years of a new technology. And when that happens, the income, the number of high-value jobs begin to go down as we begin to apply this new, not quite perfect technology to the marketplace. And we saw that happen starting in 1970 when word processors came in. I was at the IRS at the time. Every major government bureaucracy had whole floors filled with typists, the typing pool. The minute the word processor came along, boom, those jobs were gone. And so we began to do that. Meanwhile, we were also creating new high-value jobs associated with high-tech production and management, just not very fast at first. And the reason for that is straightforward. As Schumpeter explained, destruction is ever so much easier than creating things. Right? We get a new technology, and boy, can we apply that to existing jobs and reduce the labor requirement. On the other hand, to use a new technology to come up with a brand new product nobody ever heard of before, a brand new service that we've never had before, that takes time. And so there's always a lag between the destructive part of the wave of creative destruction, this part, and the creative part, which is what we are just now entering. Okay? So... On the whole, this graph and Schumpeter's model should make us feel pretty good about our current circumstances. The difficulty with that feeling good is that the people who run the country, whether it's our politicians or our captains of industry, never use the R word. They never talk about we're in a revolution. First of all, the political handlers say, G -g -g -g, don't use the word revolution for God's sake. You'll terrify the electorate. Tell them that everything is getting better. Technology is going to be great. Just don't say revolution. Beside, if you admitted that we were in a revolution, it would suggest that the dead hand of history is in charge of our lives and that we can't do anything about it. No politician would ever admit that. So we just don't talk about it. As a result of which, we are passing through a techno-economic revolution of historic proportion, and no one talks about it. Nobody even really says it's happening. And that's a terrible risk, especially for a democracy, because if nobody knows it's happening, the electorate is not likely to respond to their circumstances in an intelligent way. And that's exactly how we got into the current hole we're in. Uh, back in 2000, uh, wages had been falling, and then uh, starting in 2000, household income, median household income began to fall. So the politicians in Washington uh, got together, and it was a bipartisan agreement. We're going to have this huge tax cut because there's fewer and fewer people in the middle class. How do we, how do we uh, get them to, to go out and buy stuff? Cut their taxes, okay? Oh, and then we'll do something else, Greenspan said. We'll keep the discount rate low so it's really easy to borrow money. Good idea. And from 2001 on, that was exactly what happened. And then suddenly, blessed with much lower taxes and really low interest rates, the American consumer went out and spent like sailors on shore leave. Right? A trillion dollars a year in home mortgage equity loans for seven straight years. And they fueled the economy. So in fact, although this was still the accurate reflection of what was happening, the number of middle class jobs and upper income jobs were going down, but we began to spend back in 2000 like it was going up already. And so we were up here in the spending area, even though the income earned was down below. And as far as people saying nobody saw this coming, absolutely not true. Uh, economists were beside themselves with every passing year. They talked about the looming debt overhang, the fact that a growing share of all investments were in unregulated, speculative stocks and bonds. And they waved and they come... Now, you didn't read that if you were reading the Wall Street Journal. They said everything was fine. But if you read the pink paper, the Financial Times, or read The Economist, and remember the Brits invented economics, they were very much alarmed, and they said so. And the Americans poo-pooed them. They said they didn't understand the exceptionability of the American dream system. So here's what happened. Uh, just as the economists predicted, the two bubbles, first the housing bubble that went away in 2006, 
And then the credit bubble that was sustained by it went in 2007, and in 2008, everything collapsed. A notional $60 trillion vanished from the global capital supply, a quarter of it in this country. Uh, eight and a half million jobs went away, fueled entirely by unsustainable credit, so they didn't come back right away. Uh, median household income uh, uh, net worth went down almost 40%. Uh, and uh, a lot of money fled the stock market and went into uh, certificates of deposit and CDs. So, in fact, that's what happened, and we're still dealing with that because the economists went back and said, oh, well, we've done all kinds of studies of what happens when asset bubbles come apart. Um, they create a long-term period of deleveraging. And when that happens, um, the uh, things that happen are uh, it lasts six or seven years on average, during which public and private sector debt are reduced by a third. And, you know, we have actually done that in the private sector. And in the consumer sector, consumers have shrunk their credit card debt considerably. Um, but the government and the state and local governments, they've also reduced their overhang. The federal government, however, we're still arguing about how to deleverage that, and that isn't resolved yet. So there's a lot of big noise at the top of the stairs that hasn't come down yet. Uh, the important thing to understand is that if deleveraging lasts six or seven years after the collapse, that means the earliest we should see an end to deleveraging would not be till next year or the year after that. And once again, all the research says nothing that the politicians could do could in any way stimulate a deleveraging economy. This is the consequence of our erroneous ways, and there isn't any way to fix it by intervening in it. So all of the complaints about the politicians had only done this or that, everything would be fine. Simply not the case. Uh, we got ourselves into this hole, and it's going to take a while for us to get out. Now, I do lots of speeches. Uh, the audiences that pay lots of money for me are the wealth managers, trust departments of banks. So I do a lot of workshops for these folks, and I usually split the, the break my session. It's a three-hour uh, program. I break it in the middle, and uh, we're out in the break and people are asking questions. And invariably, and it's mostly with these wealth managers, they'll sidle up to me quietly and in almost conspiratorial tone, they'll say, so uh, tell me, uh, how long will it take the economy to get back to normal? And I said, no, didn't you understand what I said in the first half of the program? That we're in a revolution, a transformation. This is the kind of thing they write about in history books. Um, you know, 50 years from now, entire history tips will be devoted to this moment in our history. Oh. And then that guy will drift off, and then about two or three minutes later, so tell me, how soon are we going to get back to normal? And I go through the same routine. And on one occasion uh, last summer, um, and I'm a smoker, um, one of the 19% that still do that, so I slipped outside uh, to have a smoke before I went back, and this guy follows me out, and he says, so tell me, how soon are things going to get back to normal? Well, I sort of forgot myself. I just, I shouted at him. I said, no, don't you understand? We're in a revolution, not a business cycle. Things will never get back to normal. We're now in a new normal. Don't you hear everybody talk about it? And that's exactly where we're at, the new normal. E -u -a. And our future, our high-tech future, is now right around the corner. All right, here we go. Somewhere up here is what that's going to be. Well, what do we know about that situation that makes us feel good about it? Well, the first thing is the job creation rate, which has fallen steadily since the dot-com bubble burst back in 2000. It, it was we were gener the beginning of the decade, we were generating 74 new jobs for every 100 new Americans. And that fell and fell and fell until in 2008, we were only generating 49 new jobs for every 100 new Americans. But in 2010, it turned around. And now we're generating 60 new jobs for every 100 new Americans, back the way we were doing in the early part of that decade. So that's a hopeful sign. Now, the next thing is, well, BLS tells us the job creation rate's gone up. 
what are those new jobs? Oh, do we know? Yes, yes, we begin to gather all kinds of new jobs. Jobs that didn't exist at all until 2008 or 9. App writers. 475,000 people have reported, worldwide, have reported income from having written an app. About half of them in the United States. And while most of them only earned a few dollars from their apps, some people have earned millions of dollars from their apps. So it's very hard to say, well, is that a good job or a bad job? Well, it's certainly a good job for the people that made $30 million. Um, but yes, a lot of apps are written by kids, high school students, and they make $10, $20, $30, $50 uh, out of them. Uh, what other thing? Oh, sentiment, uh, data scientists. That's a great one. We didn't have that title. We even know the guy who first used it in a job application, describing himself as a data scientist. And they are growing rapidly. About 15,000 data scientist jobs have been created since 2010. They have an average salary of about $105,000, starting salary about $75,000. What exactly are they? Well, they're people who know how to work with data, which means they could be statisticians, or they could be mathematicians, or they could be modelers, math modelers, et cetera, like that. But they have to have a broader understanding of data and not be specialized in one field. So that's rapidly growing job thing. Who else? Oh, uh, sentiment analysts. My wife, when she does, my wife does my PowerPoints, and she says, uh, uh, I, she said, I thought that was all one word, sentiment analyst. Uh, what are these people? Well, you know, uh, uh, big companies now have their own website, and they host their own social networks, and they have their customers on there, and then they spy on the customers. What are they saying about our products? And of course, a lot of this is young people, and they use modern slang. And so the sociologists in the corporation say, I don't understand what these words mean. <laughs> what? And, and so a lot of high school, sentiment analysts, a lot of them are high school and college students. And they make really good money explaining that, yeah, I know, when you were young, the word bad meant bad. And then when my kids were young, the word bad meant cool. Man, wow, that's really bad. So now what does bad mean? All right. Well, it turns out it depends on what context it's used. That's why you need to have a sentiment analyst. Forensic hydrologists. You might guess what these guys are being employed. 15,000 of them. Uh, nice paying job. Uh, it's all about fracking. Um, first of all, the frackers need the uh, forensic hydrologists to show where it's safe to frack and not uh, 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 risk or jeopardize the groundwater supply. And then the people who believe the groundwater supply is being jeopardized by fracking hire the forensic hydrologist to prove that they are hurting the, uh, the water supply. Um, and, uh, and that seems to be a, a rapidly growing sort of thing. Medical note takers, uh, they had already started to appear before the, uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act was passed. But the Affordable Care Act includes something called accountable care, saying that uh, we expect the doctors and hospitals who treat patients and paid for by uh, health insurance um, are actually uh, taking account of how well they're doing. What are your outcomes? Not just that we took this person in, fixed them, and sent them out. Yeah, but a third of people checked out of hospitals re are readmitted within 30 days for the same cause. And then you get paid again for it. So they've established accountable care rules. So you have to keep track of exactly what did the doctor tell the patient before they checked out of the hospital. And then we need to make a contemporaneous record that's in clear language that the patient can understand and someone that the patient can call up and say, can you explain this to me without having to call the doctor? And that's what uh, medical note takers are. There's about 1,500 of them. They've just formed their own association now, medical note takers. Um, blended learning coaches, about 10,000 of them. As more and more K-12 and college uh, programs use online learning, it turns out that you need to have somebody to hold the hands of the all online learners until we get this institutionalized. And uh, they don't want to use full-time teachers for that. In fact, very often full-time teachers aren't very good at it. 
So, in fact, we have this new class of people uh, called blended learning coaches that are available usually 24-7 for these folks that are trying to learn at home, online, uh, for all kinds of programs. Um, uh, sleep whisperers. Uh, <laughs> They, they just formed an association. There's only about 400 of them in the country, but they've really taken off. These are people online that help insomniacs fall asleep, right? And, and they talk in these nice, soft, cajoling terms. Hello, Dave. How are you tonight? Yeah. Uh, what can we do to get you to sleep? And they have all kinds of things. They do little drummy things, little rhythms that they do, and others hum and so forth. But people pay them money to, to help them get to sleep and without pills. This is the, the, the great thing about it. They don't require uh, any kind of sleep aids. They go to sleep because these people talk them to sleep. And then biosynthesis, brand new. Uh, they have just now begun to form a, a, a professional society. Uh, and that's been made possible because several of the big genetic engineering companies have now come up with fundamental basic genes. Uh, one of them is for the E. coli virus. They take all the nasty stuff, all of the E. coli virus, and then the rest of it is core to almost every uh, gene for every kind of living uh, creature. And then you can tinker with that. You can add stuff to it that is compatible with its structure. So, and it's really funny to watch these guys do this because they look at them in terms of the molecular structure and say, okay, is there a facet or a face of this molecule that will conjoin with this one? Okay, yeah, it does. All right, we've created a brand new gene. What's it good for? Well, let's work on that, all right? And they've had so many successes almost right off the bat that suddenly a great number of people are going back to school and learning the tools to become a biosynthesis. So, yes, there's no question that what we are creating a whole bunch of new jobs that never existed before. They aren't all high-tech jobs. They aren't all huge payers. Uh, a lot of people note that uh, they get online and they rent out their house tools. Uh, you know, uh, I'm out of work, I've lost my job, but I have a wonderful garage full of drills and sanders and so forth. Now I go online for our neighborhood association and I say, hey, you want uh, any of these? You don't have to rent them from Abbey Rents. You don't have to go to the hardware store. I'll rent them to you. I'll show you how to use them even. And so they're, they're making enough money to get along. People that are making money by selling stuff on Ebays. When you run a, a yard sale now, Instead of the normal people drifting by and so forth, they're all professionals come to your yard sale. They've got a list of stuff they're looking for they know really moves fast on eBay. And they buy it from you and then turn around and dust it up and sell it for two or three times what they buy. And they're living on the income that they earn this way. So there's all kinds of new jobs being created. It's just hard to characterize them <coughs> as being uh, leading to what the post-industrial economy will look like. Now, the futurists who are visionaries, I'm a database guy, but there are a lot of futurists who are visionaries, and they write whole books about the coming high-tech manufacturing economy with robots and bioengineering and nanotechnology. And then there are other people who say, no, no, we're gonna have a green industrial economy, wind turbines, electric cars, fuel cells. Others say, no, no, it's this scientific technical service society that's already doing very well. It's going to grow and grow and we're going to sell our scientific and technical know-how around the world to people. Or the ones that are just excited by the entrepreneurship that's being created. IRS says every year there are 30,000 new micro-businesses created. Um, the number of new corporations created every year is very small, five or 6,000. So suddenly, what are micro-businesses? These are businesses with a positive cash flow and no employees. And they're mostly two or three people who get together, a, a designer, uh, a manufacturer's rep, and uh, an engineer. And they say, I got this great idea. I know we can sell it. We know where to get them. Let's, it's a watch that only has 50 minutes on it and we'll sell it to lawyers and, uh, and, and psychiatrists as a novelty item. 
And, and, and so one guy designs it, and then the, the manufacturer's rep says, okay, I know where I can farm this. I can get cheap watchworks from China and cheap cases uh, from uh, another place, and, uh, and we'll get somebody to assemble them and so forth. And they advertise them online and through mailing lists that they get uh, from the American Bar Association and so forth. And in one year, they sell about 50,000 of these things for $99 a piece. It cost them about $12 each to make. And they exhaust that market, and then they said, that's it, fine. We shut down, and the next time I come up with a new idea, I'll, I'll call you guys in and we'll get together. Or they'll go off and find another new idea. That's a micro business, and they're booming out there. Um, uh, and e-creativity. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard about the 3D printers and all the great stuff that people are doing with the 3D printers. Um, well, they're being used for all kinds of stuff that nobody ever imagined. Uh, a, a, a confectioner in Austin, Texas, prints up fancy candies and, uh, and all kinds of wonderful um, uh, icing for wedding cakes and so forth using a 3D printer. He used to have uh, two icers that did this, and they were artisans, and they had to pay a lot of money. Now all he has to do is just do a drawing of it and then feed it into the CAD system, and immediately this little 3D printer will print dozens of these decorations, candies, etc. Um, uh, people are using it to make um, uh, replacement bones. If you get a replacement hip, there, there are about three companies that make replacement hips. And they don't look like human hips at all. They are functionally correct, but um, they are smooth, etc. Now there are people using the 3D printer to print exact replicas of the old hip so that it fits perfectly in the socket with the new hip. And it costs about a quarter of what the generic uh, manufactured hip costs. Uh, so, there's people looking at that single technology, 3D printing, and are coming up with wonderful and unimagined uh, kind of things that they're doing. So the main thing is, we're clearly on the upturn of the information revolution. We're clearly creating all kinds of new enterprises and jobs, but we don't quite know how it's all going to play out. What we do know, however, is that our rendezvous with austerity, which we are just coming out of, will be followed by something else. Uh, and that something else will be a mashup with technology. Now, when I started, remember I told you that uh, we can now forecast mass use technology out eight years. So we can say some things with certainty that visionaries have been saying for 30 years. John Diebold first said we were going to have a cashless society in 1968. And we kept waiting for it. Where is it? Where is it? Even worse, um, uh, Tony Weiner said we'd have paperless offices. Uh, and that was in 1963. And we still don't have paperless offices. Well, we do now, in fact. Uh, uh, there's uh, one uh, chain of hardware stores in Oregon that prides itself in they are paperless. Their offices are paperless. Well, that's number one. By 2020, the stream of commerce in America will be cashless. It will be paperless, and we can say that with certainty. Uh, smartphones will become our e-wallets, our IDs, our driver's licenses, all of our medical information. Thank goodness we won't have, every time I go to a doctor and they give you this uh, clipboard with six pages to fill out, uh, how many bones have you broke? When did you break your bone? Oh, I'm 75 years old. I don't remember when I broke my leg when I was a kid. Um, it was sometime in the 40s, but uh, that's it. I, I know. Anyway, it's all going to be there, permanent, accurate, and then you walk up and just wave your cell phone at a little reader on the receptionist's desk, and they've got all your records. But it's also going to be an e-wallet. You'll walk up to a vending machine and wave your cell phone at it, punch the button away, and blah, blah, blah and it'll vend you the drink, and it's all cashless. Um, uh, uh, cloud computing, I'm sure you've heard of cloud computing. What is it, really? It's one of the things science fiction writers have been talking about and futurists for years. Information as a public utility, like gas, electricity, water, and now information. That's what the cloud centers permit us to do. 
Uh, because they, in fact, are being used by everybody, um, they, we need lots of them. They make computing really efficient. Uh, and here's how they do that, by the way. The typical laptop computer is used no more of its capacity than about 10 to 12 percent ever. So if you go into a big office with lots and lots of laptop computers or desktop computers, they're only used 10, 12 percent of their capacity. What a cloud center does, it takes essentially thousands of the guts of a um, desktop or a laptop computer in racks vertically so that air can pass uh, between them and they keep them cool. And they are used 100% of the time, super efficient. Um, and therefore, that's what they're for. As a result, we right now in this country have about 7,500 server centers uh, that are somewhere between 50,000 square feet and 500,000 square feet. Big buildings. They don't employ very many people, mostly maintenance technicians. 50, 75 people. Uh, they're clustered in certain parts of the country. The biggest cluster is around New York because they serve the financial markets. Second biggest cluster is around Washington, D.C. They serve the security community, NSA, who's surprised at that. Um, and and uh, then Silicon Valley, and the fourth big concentration of them is here in the Pacific Northwest, because you've got two things that server centers need. Lots of water to keep them cool, and lots of cheap power. And so there are a lot of them being built right up the Columbia Valley on both sides, Washington and Oregon. Um, they are going to be a major feature of our uh, countryside as we drive around there, seeing all these buildings. Funny thing, though. Unlike factories in the old days where the companies were really proud, this is a Ford truck factory, big signs and so forth, all these big buildings, no, the, the owners don't want anybody to know they're there. They're a target to, for uh, security people of all kinds uh, who might want to sabotage or steal data or so forth. So they're huge gray concrete block buildings with no signs on them. So if you run across these kinds of buildings, that's what they are. Those are server centers. Um, let's see, what else? Electronic medical record systems. Um, they're just now being installed. Uh, they're being installed by individual systems, which means they don't talk to one another. This is a terrible shortcoming. It'll take another 10 years for us to finally come up with standardized measures and interfaces so that the entire electronic medical record system will work. And if I am in Omaha, Nebraska, and I um, have a heart attack, they'll be able to get my records, and it will dovetail with their system, and be, they'll be able to treat me. Uh, when that happens, we will see the cost of health care plunge, and the quality of care will rise. Uh, more people are killed by medical or um, uh, practitioner uh, error than anything other than heart disease and cancer. It's a bigger killer. The medical errors is a bigger killer of people in America than anything other than heart disease and cancer. And we'll be able to eliminate a great deal of that by 2020. Uh, personal mobile technologies replacing school textbooks. Uh, I, do, I do work with the uh, publishing companies. Textbook companies say that the, uh, the last paper text will roll off the presses in 2016. After that, all textbooks, whether it's K-12, uh, college, graduate schools, they're all going to be electronic. Um, the, uh, oh, oh, yes, and we'll all be chatting with our computers. By the end of the decade, uh, the, it's not just Siri and these little simple talking things. No, no, they'll have complete personalities. And in fact, if you don't like the stock personalities they give you, you'll be able to buy specific personalities that you really like, you know, so that I can get John Wayne to be my personal assistant, right? Or Don Adams. You got that, Chief, right away. Um, so, uh, so we'll have these personalities. That'll make it a lot easier to use computers. Um, entertainment. Um, uh, uh, E-entertainment is changing the entertainment business entirely. So that, in fact, uh, electronic entertainment and, and revenues will occupy more people and generate more revenues. And that includes games and user-generated stuff on YouTube 
than all of the live, real events, sports, concerts, movies, plays. We will generate and entertain ourselves much more than other people will do it for us, and personal fortunes will be made on that as well. And finally, uh, universal connectivity. That's not just of all people, but of all things. Right? right now, there are about 3 billion people connected to the web, the internet, worldwide. Uh, there's only seven and a quarter billion of us total, so almost half of the world is already on the internet. But there are now 30 billion machines on the internet today already, communicating with one another. And all we see as we look into the future is more and more physical things communicating. All the cars will communicate with all the other cars on the road nearby them so that it'll keep us away from each other. It'll notify us when, oh, there's stuff, uh, there's an accident happening up ahead of us, and it'll slow you down automatically before you get caught up in the accident. So the Internet of Things will, and by the way, that'll introduce a huge array of wonderful things that people can do uh, as new jobs being created by all of this information that beforehand we didn't have. What the information scientists tell us is what we can measure gets managed. And as we are able to measure more and more things, we will manage it more and more. And that will create all kinds of new jobs uh, for us. So that's where we are. We're just now coming out of that long-term dip, the wave of creative destruction. We're moving out of the destructive phase and into the creative phase. But before I get into, I mean, the assumption is, okay, then colleges are going to have to provide us with the skills for all these new jobs that were being created. Yes, but there's one more dimension of our moment you need to understand before we get into the actual impact. And what is that dimension? It's big data. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard the phrase big data. Like a lot of tech phrases, it gets bandied around without anybody really know. What does that really mean? Well, we know what it's supposed to mean because the man who invented it defined it. Uh, at a speech to the National Research Council uh, in January of 2007, the chief scientist of um, Microsoft, Jim Gray, proposed a new method for scholarly research, which he called data-intensive scientific discovery. And he explained it this way. With an exaflood of unexamined data available to us and teraflops of cheap computing power, all those cloud computer centers, we should be able to make many valuable discoveries simply by searching all that information for unexpected patterns. Wow, what does that mean exactly? Well, it means a lot of things, but social scientists and demographers have already started to try this and find out what can we learn about society by putting together all kinds of data uh, from the Census Bureau and from uh, Nielsen and from uh, Gallup, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what did they find? Some of them just simply corroborated what common sense tells us. People who get married, one of whom having a high credit score, 720, 800, and another one with a low credit score of about 250, really high divorce rates, right? <laughs> now, who's surprised at that? Two people get married and they both have very high uh, credit scores? Whoa, oh, much lower divorce rates. Well, the analysts have always told us that it was uh, money troubles that what causes most divorces, and now we have the proof that it's true. Some of the other things they found. If you came from a large family with five or six brothers and sisters, your likelihood of getting divorced is much lower. If you come from a small family or a solitary child, single child, much higher divorce rates. When you were growing up, you learned to live with all kinds of different personalities and how to uh, give and take and so forth. And if you grew up as an only child, you aren't prepared to do that. Um, lots of things. They now find that, oh, if you drink three cups of coffee a day for 10 years, oh, males, they only have this for males so far, um, uh, your mort mortality rates go up. We don't know from what, because the data only told us 
oh, they have higher mortality rates than people that don't. Women, on the other hand, who drink more than two diet soft drinks for 10 years or more, have a much higher probability of heart disease. We don't know why. That's what uh, Jim Gray meant when he said, uh, we'll make these discoveries. And that, in turn, will lead us to say, oh, then this merits some research. We need to deal with this. About a month after he introduced the concept of big data, Jim Gray vanished off the face of the earth. He was sailing alone in a solitary sailing race, and they found his boat, but they never found him. In honor of him, there is a website, bigdata.com, in which scholars from all over the world have submitted papers describing how big data will change how science is done. Uh, in fact, the National Academy of Sciences has recognized big uh, data-intensive discovery as the fourth legitimate paradigm of scientific research. The first one was the one the Greeks used, observation. Uh, then we got uh, experimentation, which indeed the Greeks did some of that, but mostly that didn't come on until 1600s, 1700s, the age of the Enlightenment. The third was uh, approved in the 1960s, there uh, were things that we couldn't do in a lab, but we could simulate in computers and make discoveries that way. So that was acknowledged. And now we have the fourth, data-intensive discovery. And data-intensive discovery doesn't require much, as much of the apparatus of research that either uh, computer simulation or experimentation require. Uh, and so now, uh, big data is a big thing. Um, uh, the the uh, head of the Social Science uh, uh, Institute at uh, Harvard saying that the march of quantification made possible by cloud computing and enormous new sources of data will sweep through academia, business, and government. No area will be left untouched. The social scientists in particular are excited because they said, you know, the problem with social science is we can't actually go out and do experiments on people. Uh, which is true, but if we can scan from at a remove the, the consequences of their behavior, that will just reveal all kinds of stuff about the principles on which societies operate and decisions are made. Well, oh, they're really excited. Uh, at the World Economic Forum, uh, one speaker uh, said, data is a new class of asset. It's like land or currency or gold, and you're going to have to make use of it if you're going to be competitive. Um, Eric Brynjolfsson at the Sloan School of Management in his new book, The Second Machine Age, talks about the fact that companies that use big data to inform their decision making uh, have a 5 to 6 percent boost in productivity year after year after year. It makes them essentially competitively unbeatable. And so all kinds of corporations are using big data to go out and find out what we don't know about our customer base, uh, about uh, the environment in which we sell our products. Big data looks so good that, in fact, there are now people, including in this case of forecast from Gartner, saying big data will generate 1.9 million new jobs. Uh, this was a forecast made in 2012, and they said by 2015. So we're talking about just three years, 1.9 million new jobs. These are all the data scientists I was talking about. And then, because of the improved performance and behavior and new insights we get from the big data, there'll be another 5.7 million new jobs indirectly generated by the insight and the knowledge we get from big data. But, everybody says, well, there's a shortage of people with IT skills, math skills, statistics skills. Only one-third of those jobs will be filled. And that's why we have this mounting concern that more and more people must go to college. You know, if you don't have a college degree, you're not going to get a career-based job that you really want. The problem with that assumption is that when you go to the list of perpetually unfilled jobs, um, it says, yeah, it's true. There's 24 million underemployed or unemployed people in America today. Uh, but there's somewhere between 4 and 5 million vacancies that employers say, we can't find anybody to do these jobs. Oh, that's, and that's when the assumption says, well, the more people need to go to college. Uh, the problem is that that's not what the data tells us. The perpetually unfilled jobs 
list, and although this comes from uh, 2010, that list hasn't changed any in four years. And there's only four of them require a post-secondary degree. Uh, nurses, and they require an associate degree, and then managers, executives, engineers, doctors, and medical technicians. They require a post-secondary degree. The rest of these things, skilled building trades, uh, sales representatives, related work experience, technicians, related work experience, uh, drivers, appropriate licenses. Uh, now, now, we understand the problem with drivers. They all have to piss in a bottle once every six months, and it turns out that a lot of people who would otherwise qualify as drivers can't qualify as commercial drivers, right? Um, uh, then uh, restaurant and hotel staff, on-the-job training, vocational training, and customer service reps, related work experience. Now, we all of us have encountered customer service reps. They're the people that answer the helplines when our computer isn't working or our cell phone service is broken down, etc. They, These people, if they're good, not all of them are good, we've all encountered those, but some of them, wow, they, are, they have the patience of a saint. And they hold our hand and work us through sometimes very complicated routines. But they don't require a college degree to do that. So, in fact, that isn't what we're looking for. And not only that, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics, we're already turning out about 150% too many college graduates to uh, fill the jobs that are actually available that require a college degree. And that's across the board. <clears throat> Among associate degrees, over the current decade, we're going to award 8.7 million new uh, associate degrees, but there's only 2.9 million jobs that require those degrees. Uh, for uh, baccalaureates, four-year degrees, we turn out 17.8 million in a decade, but there's only 8.5 million jobs that require those. And that includes both the vacancies and the growth jobs. Uh, master's degree, that's the astonishing thing. We, we award 7,500 master's degrees every year, and there's only about uh, 900,000 jobs that will require them, uh, in 10 years, rather. Uh, uh, PhDs, at least the number is pretty uh, correct, but the problem is that a lot of the PhDs that are awarded are not in the fields that people need PhDs in, which is math, statistics, etc. So, in effect, while it is true that in order to guarantee yourself a good middle-class career job, you have to have a college degree. The reverse is not true. If you have a college degree, you will get a career uh, trajectory job. And so, in some respects, you could argue that the great urging uh, by the politicians and so forth of getting a college degree, it's all a Ponzi scheme that pays off often enough for enough people that everybody is willing to play the game. Unfortunately, many of them going into debt that they will never be able to repay, which is why you now hear uh, the politicians talk about there must be some way that we can get to forgive that debt or to offset that, that debt in some fashion. It's a serious problem, and it looms as a great threat to the future of post-secondary education in America if we can't get this straight. Um, now, well, what kind of skills is it that, the, that are needed that they can't find in the unemployed people but aren't college-based skills? Only a third of all current jobs, 35%, uh, require a post-secondary degree, and only a third of current jobs being offered, new created jobs, require a college degree. However, all jobs, whether you need a college degree or otherwise, as routine tasks are being informated and automated out of existence, all jobs, old and new, will require employees who are able to use information to handle non-routine tasks. This set of skills is called, broadly, higher order cognitive skills. And we've known for some time that that was what people wanted. Uh, a good example comes from this research by uh, Levy Murnane and Otor, uh, published in 2002. This was the first revelation that we had on this. And they said, look, 
What are the skills whose values have gone up since 1960 in the marketplace? Well, um, basic cognitive skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, they went up until about 1970. And then they started to go down. And right now, uh, if all your skill base is, I, I know how to read, write, and, and math. It's got the lowest value. It's lower value than either uh, manual labor jobs. And now think what that means. The No Child Left Behind Act had our K-12 system concentrating on delivering basic cognitive skills. They were, in effect, dumbing down the nation's children for jobs that pay less than manual labor jobs. What kind of jobs do have rising value? One is what they call uh, non-routine cognitive analytic. That's this line here. And what is that? Well, that's a situation in which data comes in or somebody walks in the door and says, I got this problem. And I went to the, um, the, uh, the website where you're supposed to solve this problem. I went through all the processes. I wrote a letter and it didn't work. Oh, now I have to figure out. And then the one that's even more valuable is non-routine cognitive interactive. I, I get a problem and I now have to know how to interact with other people in the organization to solve this problem. So those are the two types of skills that are steadily growing in marketplace value. Um, and we've got other research that says not only that, but across all nations and all cultures, um, strong empirical evidence shows that cognitive abilities of a population, both the minimal and the high level, you've got to have them both, rather than school attainment, read degrees, are powerfully related to individual earnings, to the distribution of income in that society, and to the economic growth of the system. It is non-routine cognitive analytic or cognitive interactive skills that really add to the value. Oh, but that does help to explain why it is that although we turn out more than twice as many college graduates as the marketplace needs, they still get hired and they get paid a pretty good wage. Why is that? Because uh, employers will pay somewhere between a 25 and 75% wage premium to college graduates who work in positions not nominally requiring post-secondary degrees because the labor market uh, accepts a college degree as tacit evidence that an individual has acquired advanced cognitive skills. Now, that's not an unreasonable assumption, but it is an assumption, and it isn't always true. And in fact, that's what we're hearing from employers now, saying they even have college degrees, and they don't seem to know how to use their tools to solve a problem. They have no gumption. Both my sons employ large numbers of uh, people with high school graduates in their job in their uh, companies that they created. And you just listen to them. I, it's wonderful. It makes me feel really old to hear them ranting and raving about the inability of high school students to think in any sort of way at all. Um, well, in fact, um, we're going to cure that, OK? Once we got an understanding in the, in the early 2000s, that uh, the higher order cognitive skills were correct, they began to develop a set of curriculum for the K-12 system in the United States, which we now are calling the Common Core Standards of Learning. That list of skills was originally developed by a group of 100 large high-tech employers back in 2000. Um, and they called themselves the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. Uh, Microsoft, Intel, uh, these kinds of companies were behind that. General Electric, et cetera. They pushed them, uh, and finally, they couldn't sell it at the local level because No Child Left Behind had already preempted that. So they developed them, and eventually, they were adapted by the uh, Department of Education 
um, uh, after Mr. Obama took office, and uh, they spell them out. Here is what the uh, higher order cognitive skills are. Systemic thinking, problem analysis, teamwork, project-based study, numeracy, cyber literacy, and self-directed learning, and I just realized that's missing one of them. Applied creativity is the one that's missing. That is what is included in the new uh, Common Core Standards of Curriculum. Um, they are, by requiring real engagement of the student and the demonstrable ability to solve problems using their basic cognitive skills, uh, they absolutely improve the mastery of both the basic and the advanced cognitive skills. Standard K-12 tests for these skills will be issued in the fall of this year for K-12 by the uh, Department of Education, and uh, the SATS system will be converted to the higher order skills in 2016 for the SAT tests. But in order to get this done, the Education Department had to agree that no one would be made to adopt these uh, standards. They were purely voluntary. And increasingly, across the country, they have become a political football. Well, there's some of the reasons why. Um, first of all, in order to make room in the regular K-12 curriculum for these new skills, they had to knock some of the old skills out we don't need to do anymore. For instance, they took out long division. They said, you don't need to teach people long division. Uh, because, I mean, i got a watch here that'll do long division. Uh, you don't really need that anymore. Uh, but there are some traditional educators say, no, no, there are some unique mental processing skills that you get from long division. You don't get any other way, and therefore you've got to keep that. Even worse, um, it eliminates cursive writing as a basic skill in, in K-12. Lordy, lordy, there have been school administrators, school superintendents fired by their boards because they agreed to drop cursive writing from the requirements of the local school system. I mean, you get arguments like, you know, how would the nation have ever had its independence if John Hancock couldn't have written his big signature across the bottom of that piece of paper? It, it, you know, so that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. Uh, there are now three or four states that have decided to back out of the Common Core, saying, no, no, we're here in Oklahoma, here in Texas, we're smart enough to come up with a set of standards that are right for us. But understand now, the Common Core Standards doesn't talk about what subjects you are taught. It talks about how you teach them so that they learn how to make use of the basic skills that you in the local school system have set up. So there's where we're at with that. Um, now, we are now faced with a cognitive skills deficit. A large number of the unemployed people that are out there now are not going to be able to get jobs because they don't possess higher order cognitive skills. They may be perfectly skilled at a particular field, but they're only equipped to follow instructions or do things that are routine. And what we're going to do with routine jobs is eliminate them all with computers over the next five, six, seven, eight years. Um, there are essentially no institutions today that offer a formal course of instruction specifically designed to teach higher order cognitive skills. It's just a huge hole in our educational system. And the thought that, well, post-secondary institutions, since they already sort of teach those skills by osmosis, why don't we have them do that? And then that would give the colleges and universities uh, my colleague, Edward Gordon, who just has this new book out called Future Jobs, wonderful book, if you'd like to look into this a little further, and what he says is, the cost of the current post-secondary education system is so high, and it's so labor-intensive, there's no way in the world those institutions can do this job for us. It's, uh, we've got to do it, and we've got to do it now. There's already evidence that our inability to fill those four to five million jobs that, that employers are talking about is causing us to have a drag on growth, domestic product growth, by 1% to 2%. So what are we doing to close that gap? Well, first of all, a growing number of U.S. firms which had stopped paying 
for employee training almost all together over the last 30 years as a measure of increasing return to investors. They said, we don't have any real evidence that training makes any money for us. We don't get a good ROI, so they quit training. And as a result, the profitability went up, but now they don't have a reservoir of workers with enough skills. So suddenly, big increase in employee training. Number two, they are now in one-third of all the U.S. high schools, some kind of career and technical education academy. I checked. Most of the high schools in Portland have a career or technical academy, and when they talk about installing such academies in some schools, you still get parents saying, no, 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 those are the dummy jobs. My kid's going to go to college. I don't want to have any of this vocational stuff. They misunderstand entirely the nature of our challenge here. Uh, local, public, private, and nonprofit collaboratives all over the country where employers are saying, I can't get, I'm going to have to move my business to some other city because I can't get people with higher order cognitive skills. And so the local school system gets together with the local community college and some nonprofit, you know, a, a local foundation, and they'll set up a new type of institution, uh, which is or are called retains. I'm not really keen on the name, regional talent innovation networks are being created all over the country um, by local governments in small towns and big cities. Uh, the North and South Dakota, where they've had this huge boom in gas and oil production, and they need all kinds of skills, workplace skills for that kind of job. Welding, not just welding welding, but welding that requires trigonometry, and all kinds of advanced skills in order to put together um, a different s diameter pipes at different angles and things like that. And so how do they get them? They've created in Fargo, in Moorhead, in Mandan, and Bismarck, they've created these retains uh, so that they uh, turn out people that are immediately hired. They're, these are vacancies waiting for the jobs. Um, and, and then finally, community colleges are rapidly developing new curricula based on the changing market demands. Uh, in speaking to some folks from Portland State earlier today, I said, I talked to a lot of community colleges. They think this moment in history is great. Wow, they are entrepreneurial. They're going out there, they're finding exactly the kind of skills that people need that are marketable, and they're creating courses to do that kind of job. Uh, and meanwhile, the baccalaureate institutions are really worried. They're not at all clear how they're supposed to deal with this new workplace requirement. Um, one of the startling and sparkling examples, and you can look this up online, it's really interesting, is an institution called College for America. It's actually the creation of the University of Southern New Hampshire, uh, which is a baccalaureate institution, but they said, we need to, uh, we're, we're spending way too much on remedial training. People come out of high school, and we have to put them the first year all in remedial courses. They can't write a sentence, they can't spell, they can't do math. Well, let's do this. We'll create an online program, which they have. You can subscribe to it now, College for America. First year, uh, about uh, 11, 1,200 enrollees all online, self-paced, and how do you know you passed it? It's competency-based. You take tests, it is certified by the Northeast Accreditation Bureau, so it's actually a valid thing, and they can take those credits and use them as uh, transferable into a four-year college. Um, and as I say, all online, flat price, $5,000. If you finish it all in six months, $5,000. If you finish it, it takes you five years, $5,000. That's it. Flat fee. Their marketing people believe that within three years, they'll have 350,000 people signed up for that one community college course. And in fact, there's a half a dozen other community colleges around the country, like Macomb uh, College, the largest uh, community college in America, in Detroit. Uh, and they plan to be doing that so that very quickly, they're going to gobble up a large share of the community college stuff, and it'll be transferable. Who else is doing some really exciting stuff out there? Uh, 
I pointed the wrong thing at the wrong stuff. The real challenge now is to the four-year institutions. If, in fact, the K-12 system using Common Core standards and the community college using their own creation of skill clusters is going to be able to provide the great bulk, 70% of the population, with the kind of higher order cognitive skills that satisfy the work requirements for 70% of the jobs in America, what on earth are the baccalaureate institutions going to be focusing on as their uh, objective? Uh, especially when higher education is now facing some dreadful headwinds. First of all, uh, the fiscal deleveraging as a result of the bursting of the bu uh, credit and asset bubble uh, has resulted in a reduction of government funds to higher education of about 35%. And that money isn't going to come back anytime soon. So that's a huge hit right there. And most of it has been covered by what? By increasing the tuition requirements. Uh, Wall Street has downgraded the bond ratings of higher education, including the big blue ribbon colleges like Harvard, MIT. They said, you guys, your business model is no longer au courant. Uh, it's not going to make money. So if you need to float a bond issue to pay for a new building or a new facility, well, we're not going to give you a AAA credit rating. Uh, economists are warning that at now at $1.2 trillion and growing, the college tuition debt and the default rate is rising very rapidly, is going to constitute another bubble. Uh, and therefore, it, it's going to be, somebody's going to have to pay for that, probably the taxpayer. Um, the social scientists are saying rising college tuition has made college a barrier to upward mobility in America instead of a ladder to upward mobility in America. And finally, the politicians in the state houses and in the federal legislature. Uh, it's really nasty, the things they are saying about higher education. There's no proof that it really provides us with that much value. Uh, maybe we should just cut out all those loan programs. Well, if they did that, they would assure that college would then be absolutely a class-based system in which the wealthy people will go and get the skills for the really good jobs, and nobody else will have anything else. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's now facing the leadership of higher education in America. Um, now, the result of that is that there are a lot of people out there saying gloom and doom about the four-year college institutions. Uh, this is from Clayton Christensen, a man who has made an industry out of warning higher education of the impending disaster. And what they said in a recent New York Times article, uh, a host of struggling colleges and universities, the bottom 25% of every tier in higher education, we predict, will disappear or merge in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, and traditional universities are showing the strains of their broken business models, reflecting the demand and pricing pressures that have been unheard of previously. Previously, higher education was the uh, most desirable acquisition you could have. It was a surefire investment to prosperity in the future, and now it isn't. Uh, well, so what's happening? A debate is now going on, and it's, uh, you can read it online. I have a network of about 30 scanners, and there are more and more stuff just pouring in about what's happening in higher education. And basically the debate is the traditionalists and that many of them are in the liberal arts and humanities, are saying the only thing wrong with higher education is that the government quit uh, subsidizing it. If they just gave us back our money and left us alone, everything would be perfect. And they write these wonderful essays that appear in the New Yorker and Atlantic Monthly about the glories of higher education of the old style, of the wonderful uh, personal experiences that all of us had in that campus experience. I absolutely had a perfect experience. The eighth day I was on campus, I met the woman who, uh, who immediately um, began to type all my papers. And, and now, 60 years later, she types all my PowerPoints. 
I mean, it's wonderful. The trajectory of my life has really been affected by my college. But they're saying it's, it's um, that's all we did. Just let us go back to doing what we did, you guys. And then there are the transformers. There are a whole bunch of them, different types. The edupreneurs, they're the ones that are sponsoring the MOOCs, uh, Coursera, edX, Udacity. Some of them are not for profit. Some of them are for profit. Uh, there's all kinds of business models. The first uh, massively online open courses uh, were failures, disasters, but they learned from the failures. Now there are all kinds of uh, MOOCs that are being executed and executed well and being positive and successful. Um, then there's the workplace prep people. They've embraced the new uh, authorization by the U.S. Department of Education that the accreditation bureaus can come up with standards for competency-based tests as well as t seat time, which is the way that all accreditation has been done up till now. So now several of the regional accrediting agencies have adopted a standard. So here are the tests that you can demonstrate that you actually have a proficiency or competency in a skill, and it doesn't matter how much seat time you take to do that. And so that's the kind of thing, like I mentioned, the College for America. Um, uh, then there are those people that says it's science, technology, engineering, and math. That's the only thing that's worth doing. Uh, and so we ought to concentrate on that. And you ought to listen to the debates on the floors of some state houses where they're saying we should eliminate from the university all of the liberal arts and humanities courses. What the hell good are they? Uh, we should only teach the STEM skills. And then along come the artists. These are the creative arts people, performing arts people, and they say, no, 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 no. Art is really part of the STEM branch. Uh, they demonstrate stuff. There's great collaboration. There are three engineering schools now that have absorbed the art schools in their university. Texas A&M, uh, University of Florida, University of North Carolina. Uh, the, the art school has now moved over to engineering. It's an arm of engineering, or the artists say engineering is now an arm of the arts, right? Um, but th they've done that, and they call those STEAM skills instead of uh, STEM skills. And then there are people who are saying, wait, no, no, no. We ought to use big data discovery to find out what are the really valuable skills that everybody has and to evaluate which courses actually deliver the greatest success and the outcomes for students. And then once we do that, we'll know exactly how to design the perfect college curriculum. All of that is happening right now as we speak, as we sit in this room. Now, the man, um, here are some examples. Uh, uh, the University of Maine at Presque Isle, they've just announced they're going to convert their in existing four-year baccalaureate program uh, to a self-paced, competency-based, assessed program by 2018. They're not going to change the content of the program. They're just going to come up with the measures of competency that are required to pass the program. Uh, and I mentioned Southern uh, New Hampshire University. Uh, where they're going to say, here, here's our online program, nine workplace competency clusters, they'll charge you 5K for it, and we're expecting to have a third of a million people enrolled in two years. Uh, Georgia Tech uh, has just offered an all MOOC-based uh, master's degree in engineering for $6,500. Uh, the regular on-campus ma master's of engineering costs 37005 so they're undercutting their own price by an enormous amount. They expect that most of these people will be overseas folks who want an engineering degree. But they don't know that for sure, and they're not barring domestic things. So big experiment, big risk. Uh, MIT is now circulating online. Once again, you can go online and actually read the syllabus. Uh, they're going to unbundle their baccalaureate degree. Uh, first year will be all online. You won't even come to campus. Second and third years will be on campus. The fourth year will be in practicum. You'll have a job. Either it'll be lined up for you by the placement department at the college, or you'll go out and find it on your own and then be able to demonstrate that it merits uh, college credit. It'll, once again, it'll all be uh, uh, based on competency and proficiency, not on seat time. And what it means is they empty out half the campus. 
because there's only two years of the four-year program on campus, that means they can bring in more people to MIT on the campus. Um, so those kinds of things are right now, they're happening this moment. And there are only in a, five examples of literally hundreds of innovations that are now going on of all kinds throughout higher education in America. Um, and uh, the most dramatic in, uh, initiative, however, is probably this one, uh, the history and future mostly of higher education, or how we can unlearn our old patterns and relearn for a happier, more productive, ethical, and socially engaged future. It, it, it's an online course that was run from January to March of this year by Duke University. Uh, 50,000 students enrolled from all over the world. Um, and the syllabus opened with, far too little has changed inside educational institutions to prepare students for the demands, problems, restrictions, obstacles, responsibilities, and possibilities of living in the world outside of education. This course addresses one question. How can we all, together, work to redesign higher education for our future, not for someone else's past? Now, they have not published the result. They're compiling now the outcome of this class. And it will be, uh, everybody in higher education is waiting for this as a blockbuster document. Because the 50,000 people who signed up are university presidents and deans and students and faculty, all kinds of people signed up for this. It's the first attempt to reach the entire, all stakeholder population of higher ed to ask how should we redesign this venerable and valuable institution. It's been around for a long time. Uh, classroom instruction was invented simultaneously by the ancient Sumerians and the Chinese about 2500 BC. So it's a pretty well honed tool for teaching. But that doesn't mean it will always be here. And what we're wrestling with now is how to change that. And while we're at it, the man who led the Common Core uh, movement in Great Britain at the same time as we had ours, he was successful. They are also, they've changed the K-12 curriculum in Britain to, to mirror the Common Core. And then after he finished that, he began to realize that if society is changing as a result of all this technology, how can we possibly design the university to provide the skills for that if we don't first reimagine society? And now we appreciate where we are. We are in a revolution, a genuine historic event and as I suggested uh, uh, earlier, uh, 50 years from now, whole history chips will report on how well or how badly we adopted to this revolutionary change. This is a dramatic, exciting moment. We are in the process of creating not just the future of higher education. We are creating the future of the world. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're, we're uh, running a little longer than normal, but I hope you feel that this is worthwhile. But if some of you have to leave, please do so quietly. You want to stay for the, uh, the real interesting part is the Q&A, so hang on. Okay, so we get the mics going. Somebody go, go up to the mics. One on each side. Yes, microphones up here if you've got a question. A lot of people are overwhelmed by the future. Don't feel surprised you don't have a good of course, I mean, a real picture of the future is a startling thing. Most people don't do it. Most people are visionaries, and they make nice, round, warm statements about the future. Come I'm a data here. guy, and I just dumped on you a lot of data. But it's as certain as anything can be about the future. Yes? Yes. You go on over there. Go I think she's first. She's first. Oh, OK. okay. Right. Fine. Hi, um, my name is Chris Allman, and I'm a data gal. I'm a physician by education. Um, 
the first time I heard about quants was with the financial engineering that occurred, and we saw the equations that were used that, that led to the financial meltdown, the liar loans, et cetera. First time I heard about uh, big data was when I was starting to see what was being collected in our public education systems and through electronic medical records. And as I think about the negative externalities of what we see with big data, to name a few, Edward Snowden has revealed the surveillance. Um, we have also commercial exploitation and fraud. Um, I just am recently, as of a few weeks ago, um, a victim of tax identity related um, theft of my identity. And I found out how poor the algorithms of the IRS are in terms of identifying the fact that I am who I am or my husband is who, who he is. So my question for you, as you are a, what sounds like a technological solutionist, what about all the next negative externalities and what about all those sociologists we're going to need to figure out about this social engineering that you're suggesting we do? Uh, thanks for the question. It is, in fact, one of the common questions you have at this moment about the quants. It's really astonishing to me that the quants, who are clearly identified in everybody's mind as, these are the guys that sank the financial services system. Brooksley Bourne goes around the country and said, I predicted they were going to do this back in 1999, and Alan Greenspan wouldn't let me write a paper that revealed that this was going to happen because it would scare the markets. And now what? Quants are spreading out from the industry they wrecked, financial services, and they're going into every other field because they're showing them I can use numbers to make more money for you. So that's what we're dealing with in the free market economy. And the one thing that I have as a response to that, as, as a quant guy is, um, uh, uh, Schumpeter, when he wrote his first great treatise on waves of creative destruction and that, there was a chapter in the book, chapter seven, that talked about the social responsibility and the role of government in managing these kinds of transformational moments. He said they have two responsibilities government does. One is to educate people so they can deal with the new decision uh, systems and the new tools. And the second is the social support programs to deal with those people who have been displaced by the revolution and, and the wave of creative destruction. Um, that chapter disappeared from his book after the first edition, largely because the quantitative analysts in, of the equilibrium economists said, hey, we can't model that stuff, and so we're not going to pay attention to it. And, and so he took the chapter out of the book. And in fact, when I read the book, it was the 1926 version. I never knew about it until about six months ago when someone said, hey, here's this missing chapter. And look what it describes that we need to deal with this kind of a transformation in order not to have it destroy the good aspects of free market democracy and capitalism. And it's missing. And that's, now we're back to that issue. There needs to be government intervention and regulation on the use of data improperly. There needs to be intervention on all of these things to uh, deal with the potential excess of unbridled capitalism using these new tools. And right now, there's no one in favor of that. And in fact, the Republicans are by and large saying, no, we need less government. That's the only problem we have. We have too much government, too much taxation. If we just back up, we have the free market handle it. Ah. So that's the middle of the, of the thing we're, we're dealing with. The other aspect of your question, which is, isn't there an awful lot of terrible, high-risk things possible as a result of this information revolution? Absolutely. The excesses are patently potential there. But the problem is, we can't go back. We can't turn the clock around. We can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The power tool that is the computer and all of its applications is in fact, has with it the potential to really improve everything, every aspect of the world, including 
making it sustainable. The only way we're going to be able to have lives that are good and full and still have it sustainable and not use up all the raw materials, pollute and poison the atmosphere, information technology is the only thing that's going to enable us to manage sustainability. So we can't go back. We have to go forward recognizing that there are all of these risks and, and all of this huge organized crime that makes a ton of money uh, out of going into these uh, immature mechanisms now. As you say, the IRS algorithms for their security system, they were put in when I was still at the IRS and I left there in 1981. So, you know, they haven't bothered to upgrade those. Take a look around most places. Once you install a, a new capital good, people don't think about, now we have to worry about replacing that when it wears out or when it gets obsolete. Nobody thinks about that. They just keep on going forward. What's the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, without looking at the infrastructure that we have to maintain or the whole house of cards falls apart. Um, I, that is not a pat answer, but it's, the fact is we live in a, not only a complex world, but as the, the French philosopher Teilhard de Chardin said, it is a, a complexifying world. It will only get more complex as the quality of life goes up and as we manage more and more of our circumstances. We're going to have to deal with that complexity. And this technology is the only tool we have to deal with it. The idea that we can go back to a simpler time is romantic and appealing, but it's not plausible. We have to go forward, and forward includes this technology and all of its capacity, and presumably the government oversight to keep it from being abused and misused. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Gordon Ware. I'm a former physicist, and then a recovering I, physicist. Did you say? I. <laughs> anyway, I loved physics. I loved art, and I went back to school and I got my degree in architecture. Okay. I am very concerned, from what you've been saying, that it seems to me we are going to see machines, robots, computers take over the world. In what way? You mean do all the work and leave no work for anybody to do? Well, Which is a com one common... It seems like more and more manufacturing, one area, is getting controlled by and produced by computers and robots. Absolutely. I'm seeing from what you're saying that if that happens that's a good thing yeah if computers take over the world if robots no, no, take no, over no, the no, world no, let's just go as far as you said they're going to do all the manufacturing okay okay just accept that all right now that doesn't mean taking over the world i'm not convinced that that couldn't happen. Well, that's another story, though. It's another issue. Doing the manufacturing, and that doesn't mean it's going to do all the manufacturing. For example, I was just um, um, reading about the Brompton bicycle. I don't know, we may have some Brompton bicycles in this town. It's the world's number one folding bicycle. Mm, okay. And, and, mm. and uh, people, uh, uh, bankers use it in London, and it folds up so small that they can uh, just carry it like a suitcase and get on a subway and things like that with it. It's 1500 bucks. It's handmade in Britain with all British materials. Um, it is so carefully milled that the tolerances are so good that there's no way you can manufacture, mass produce this thing. It is so uh, wonderfully complex in its design. And, and they said, no, we couldn't uh, export this to a place with cheap labor. Cheap labor wouldn't care enough to do this right, to mill everything within a thousandth of a, of a micrometer, to make it so that it always works and it doesn't degrade with time, et cetera. Well, so I'm suggesting is, first of all, this artisanal manufacturing that is rising up right now in all kinds of fields and in all kinds of countries that is stuff that 
computers can't do, robots can't do. It would cost too much to design the robot and, and so forth. Yes, to mass produce Phillips shavers, absolutely. The new Phillips factory in Holland makes the same number of shavers as the old Phillips factory in China. But the old Phillips factory has 750 employees and this one has seven. And, and, and it's all robotic, it's spectacular. On the other hand, where will all the jobs be? It will be in maintaining the global system. Uh, all of the system that makes this work, the maintenance and upkeep and repair of the system can't be done by robots. Every system is different, and therefore you can't program a robot to uh, service, well, okay, I'll program a robot to service this uh, oil refinery. But this doesn't have the same design as that one, and, and that one is different, etc. So, in fact, all of this, the maintenance of the infrastructure that is absolutely essential for the quality of our system is labor intensive. The cutting edge of new things, when we discover them, before we can automate them or anything else, we have to first understand what this new problem is, what this new issue is, how do we approach it? Huge amount of work involved in keeping our system going and reducing the amount of consumption the, the watchword for the future is live better living, less consumption. How do we, all of us, including the rising third class of the, of, the, of the developing world, as well as us, how do we live as well as we're living now? Because the alternative, the kind of, uh, you know, we'll all have to scrimp and save, and if we all economize, we can all manage to live together and, and be sustainable. No, no, the, the bright upside uh, view of that is, no, no, if we do things more efficiently, and there are people already talking about really efficient manufacturing, not just that uses robots, but doesn't waste any material or content. Or Instead, we recycle everything, either in the process or the product is designed. When it's all done and we're ready to get rid of this automobile or the bicycle or whatever, every single piece of it is recyclable and make in something else. So we're not depleting the resource supplies that we've got, which is finite. We will get to a point where there's no way we could possibly feed, clothe, and house all these middle class people, given the assumption of what kind of consumption they believe they're entitled to have. And there's no way we're going to be able to say to the rising middle class of China, sorry, sorry, you can't consume as much as the Western middle classes because we got here first. You're going to have to have a lower standard of expectation. That ain't going to work. No, that doesn't What we work. have to be able to do is to say, you'll be able to live as good a quality life as you ever did, and it won't cause as big a consumption of resources, including the air and the water, because we get better and better at it. And it's the self-improvement of that system that will occupy our time and attention from now on. Okay, I hate to say it, but we're, we do have a Thank dinner you. that he's gonna go to. We're gonna have Thank to go, so last question. Oh. Okay. Actually, it's not a question, but more of a thank you for putting some stuff in perspective. Uh, my name is Ian Forwood. I'm an owner of a, a power utility quality assurance and quality control inspection company. Okay. Uh, we have to use... A wave of the future. Oh, that's a business that's a part of the future. We, have, we use a wave of labor force along with inspection equipment. Um, cross training those components has been a, 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 it's been a quandary for us because of our labor force having the lack of education on using the tallying systems to keep this stuff monitored and inspected, we found ourselves having to train our own personnel because there's no uh, educational format that's uh, producing a, a labor force outcome on this. Right. What's scaring me is the duration of time that we have to endure this, this uh, negative until we actually see a productivity. Well, and there out. are people right now, and you can go online, you can chase them down that are coming up with games, for example, that teach higher order cognitive skills. In fact, most games already involve higher order cognitive skills, but they don't call them, that's what you're getting out of this game is you're learning higher order cognitive skills, but they're designing games that do that so that the, the, the players can learn those skills. I guess the question I have to ask myself is where to find these sources then? 
because this is readily this is information that's not readily available or I haven't been able to identify yet. Right, and and you, once again, you go online and you, you know, start by looking higher order cognitive skills. All right. And uh, and then or link it up with higher order cognitive skills and games. And you put those two together, you will, I guarantee, get a number of hits of people that are doing that for individual cognitive skills and a whole array of them. It's now at the, it's now at the starting area. They're being beta tested, et cetera. But they are out there and they are actually being done. Okay, right. Okay, we have to run. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.